everyone and welcome to our expert briefings. I am Krista Ellis, Community Engagement Manager at the Parkinson's Foundation. Our expert briefing today will be focused on research being done to support and advance treatments for Parkinson's disease. There is still a lot we don't know about Parkinson's disease and through research, efforts are being made to close the gaps in our knowledge and understanding. During today's expert briefing, we will learn about current research that is taking various approaches to develop a treatment that may significantly slow Parkinson's disease progression. Before we begin the formal briefing, I will share a little bit about the Parkinson's Foundation. The Parkinson's Foundation is a nonprofit focused on bettering the lives of those living with Parkinson's through improving care and advancing research. Importantly, everything we do is done in close concert with our community to ensure that our actions are aligned with the needs and priorities of those living with and impacted by Parkinson's. Today's program is just one example of how we are meeting our goals. It's officially Parkinson's Awareness Month. This year, we'll be sharing the ABCs of PD to spread the word about Parkinson's disease from A to Z. Follow along this month as we highlight one aspect of PD for each letter of the alphabet. Find resources or help spread the word about Parkinson's disease by visiting parkinson.org awareness. We wanna thank this webinar sponsors, UCB and Novartis for supporting our mission. Thank you, UCB and Novartis. The Parkinson's Foundation provides weekly education and wellness programs virtually through our PD Health at Home series, including Mindfulness Mondays, Wellness Wednesdays, Fitness Fridays, our expert briefings, and our Spanish language programming, EP Salud on Casa. Find out more and register for our PD Health at Home programs at parkinson.org slash pdhealth. Now we'd like to get to know who's joining us today. We're going to launch a poll. And if you're on Facebook, please join, uh, respond by using the comments section. Tell us what best describes your connection to Parkinson's disease. Are you a person with PD, a spouse or partner? Does your parent have Parkinson's? Are you a healthcare professional? And perhaps you're joining us with a different perspective. Let us know. Well, looks like we're having an overwhelming response of our community who are living with Parkinson's. I see you. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, yeah, 75% of our community members are a person with Parkinson's disease, 16% bringing in as a spouse or a partner, and the remaining has a parent with Parkinson's, other healthcare professionals here. Thank you all so much for being here today. Please know for your convenience, we are recording today's expert briefing and the recording will be available online. We will also be emailing a link to the recording and other resources related to today's topic. So sit back and enjoy learning through conversation with our expert. And now I'd like to introduce our expert presenter, Lorraine Kalia is an associate professor and clinician scientist in the Division of Neurology at the University of Toronto and a senior scientist at the Crimble Research Institute of the University Health Network. She holds appointments with the University of Toronto's Tans Center for Research in Neurodegenerative Diseases and Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology. She's also a staff neurologist in the Morton and Gloria Shulman Movement Disorders Clinic and the Edmund J. Saffer Program in Parkinson's Disease at the Toronto Western Hospital. Her clinical work and research program focuses on Parkinson's disease and related movement disorders. With an eye always on the clinic, she has a research team focused on understanding the key molecular mechanisms responsible for neurodegeneration in Parkinson's disease to identify therapeutic agents that can modulate these molecular targets. Dr. Kalia holds the Wolfen Krimble Chair in Parkinson's Disease Research, and she is the co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Parkinson's Disease. Dr. Kalia, welcome, and thank you for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. Thanks so much for inviting me, and I'm so excited to be here today. I'm going to um, start sharing my slides. Great. Um, so I am so excited to be here today, and I thank you so much for the invitation. Um, as you already heard, um, I first put up here uh, disclosures uh, related 
some of which are related to what I'm going to speak to today, which are related to actually treatments that are in development for Parkinson's disease. But as you already heard, it is uh, April and April is Parkinson's Awareness Month and tomorrow is actually World Parkinson's Day. And such an important part of awareness is education. And so it's important that we educate others about Parkinson's disease. It's important that we educate each other about Parkinson's disease. So I hope today that over the next 40 minutes or so, I'm gonna be able to share with you some things that maybe you didn't know about Parkinson's disease and make you think about things. And uh, most importantly, I hope that I'll be able to share with you the optimism that I have uh, regarding where we're moving forward with um, understanding the disease uh, and uh, making progress with respect to novel treatments. The learning objectives uh, for this session uh, that the, the Parkinson's Foundation um, really wanted us to discuss today are, are laid out here. Um, I'm gonna discuss advancements in disease modifying approaches for Parkinson's disease. And these are gonna include pharmacological and non-pharmacological types of ways. This is not going to be exhaustive. There's so much going on and so much complexity to the research that's going on that I'm really gonna give you a kind of bird's eye view of aspects that I'm particularly excited about and um, probably aspects that you've heard about from others or reading on the internet uh, to maybe give you a little bit more um, understanding of what's happening in this area. The bulk of the conversation will be about advancements, but I think it's really important for us to actually take a moment, uh, which I will at the end, to just discuss challenges, because although there's a lot of optimism in the field and there's a lot of progress being made, um, obviously these things aren't going to happen overnight. Uh, and there are a number of challenges that we will face and will continue to face as we advance towards disease modifying therapies. The first thing that I just want to lay out here, and I'm sure that this is familiar to everyone, uh, well, almost everyone in the audience, um, primarily because the audience members are primarily those living with Parkinson's disease, is that Parkinson's disease is not a static condition. It's a progressive disease that changes over time. And this is just a very somewhat simplistic diagram that tries to capture a couple of aspects of this progressive nature of the disease. I'm just gonna point out a couple of things because I'm gonna come back to these aspects uh, kind of throughout the talk. So what's shown here is um, over across this uh, X axis of this graph is time. So time moving from left to right, um, and then moving from the bottom of the graph to the top of the graph, the degree of disability that can be associated with Parkinson's disease. And what each of these triangles are trying to depict are how there are different aspects of the disease that develop over the course of the disease, as well as the way that they can um, impact each other and be additive to, the, to the, ex the experience that people have with Parkinson's disease. So this uh, triangle here represents non-motor features of the condition, such as sleep disruption, cognitive difficulties, mood difficulties. On top of that are the classic motor features that basically define the condition. And then on top of that are complications that come with some of the medications that we have. And what I have at the top of the graph here are really symptoms, things that are experienced by people who have the condition. But what I want to also point out is that what's happening underneath is the process of the disease, primarily what we call neurodegeneration, which is the loss of brain cells over time. We're all losing brain cells over time. This happens in adulthood, but in Parkinson's disease, this happens at a faster rate. And this is really what underpins the symptoms that one, what, what, what people experience. And while currently we have a lot of different therapies and medications that we can pre prescribe to treat symptoms, we really are very at the very beginning stages of having to, to, to be able to have really any impact on the actual process of the disease, which is the loss of these neurons, ways to actually slow the progression or stop these cells from dying. So with that, before I kind of launch into, I use this term at the beginning, disease modifying therapies, which is what we're gonna be talking about, but I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page as to what that actually means. So there are a variety of different strategies we can take to tackle Parkinson's disease progression. And here, I just want you to imagine this arrow as the progression of Parkinson's disease over time, a kind of simplified version of what I showed you in the previous graph. And what we have right now, as I mentioned, are symptomatic therapies. I put a Band-Aid over top of this because we have 
we have therapies that can kind of mask what's happening underneath by, by treating the symptoms. So making tremor less, making mobility easier, making mood better, uh, but really underneath the disease is still progressing. In the best case scenario, our ideal would be actually to prevent the disease entirely. So be able to, even before it starts, nip it in the bud, nobody ever ha has to develop Parkinson's disease. And this is really the gold standard. This is what we will be and continue to aspire towards. I'd say the second best scenario is having a cure, meaning that you can start developing the disease, but then we have a treatment that can reverse that and bring you right back to where you were, where you didn't have a disease. And of course, that's a huge ideal uh, for us to try and reach as well. But where we're at right now, and probably what's going to happen before we are able to accomplish these two really huge goals is to be able to have therapies that we call disease modifying. And what we mean by that is that it doesn't stop the disease, it doesn't prevent the disease, but it can slow the disease. I put a, a little arrow here to suggest that the progress is slower or less severe. And I would um, hope that these kinds of therapies would have a meaningful benefit for people because instead of the progress that one experiences normally with the condition, we'd be able to maybe at least reduce it uh, substantially so that um, what, what symptoms were like in the first couple of years of the disease would be similar to what they are a couple of years in and, and, and further and further. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today because although we are all working on these aspects of tackling Parkinson's disease, I think we're probably gonna see the biggest progress in disease modifying therapy in the upcoming years. And, um, and so I wanna give you guys an update as to where that's progressing. With respect to disease modifying therapies, I always often like to show this slide, uh, which is a non-Parkinson's disease slide, because currently in Parkinson's disease, we don't really have any disease modifying therapies. And sometimes people argue that this is because brain disease is very complicated, which it is. Um, but I often like to show this slide because this is actually a slide of disease modifying therapies that exist for a different brain disease, multiple sclerosis. And in fact, this is an outdated uh, slide because there are even more uh, of these therapies now available. But as you can see, there's a, a huge number of therapies that exist in multiple sclerosis that have been able to be used for patients and slow and change the course of their disease. And so I think this is something for us to aspire to um, and really shows us that, um, that brain diseases are amenable to disease modifying therapies. This here is a Parkinson's disease slide, uh, and it doesn't show actual disease modifying therapies that exist. But I like to show this slide as well, just to give a kind of snapshot as to how active this area of research is. So let me just orient you to this slide. And I just really wanna give credit to Kevin McFarthing, who's a person with Parkinson's disease who is involved in generating a summary of the different kinds of uh, drugs that are in trial and, and publishes them in the journal of Parkinson's disease. And so this is this together with colleagues, he's put together this uh, graph uh, that is I think very um, helpful uh, for us to get an idea of where we are in terms of research uh, and, and is really useful for researchers to just see uh, the different types of therapies that are being pursued. So just to orient you to this, this large circle is all different uh, therapies that in, in 2023, um, uh, Kevin had found uh, to be in clinical trials. These are phase one trials, so very, very early trials all the way to phase three trials, which are the more advanced trials where um, if they're successful, medications often go to market. And the top half of this circle represents drugs that are disease modifying, potential disease modifying therapies, so DMTs, uh, whereas the bottom half are just symptomatic therapy. So you can see Parkinson's disease research, there's a lot of activity going on, and there's a huge amount of activity going in uh, to the disease modifying therapy. I will not be going through all of the different um, drugs that are being uh, tested in clinical trials for disease modifying therapies, but I really thought it was important uh, for us to be able to see this kind of bird's eye view snapshot as to how much is actually going on. I also point you to this website here, uh, which is actually Kevin McFarthing's um, kind of in real time updated list of different therapies that are in clinical trial, which he calls the hope list. So let's dive in. Uh, as I said, we're gonna discuss advancements in disease modifying approaches. And I wanted to just use those first couple of minutes to make sure that we all were on the same page as to what I'm talking about when I'm talking about disease modifying therapies. This is going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour. Um, 
This is a short list of uh, the different kinds of disease modifying therapies that are actively being investigated. Like I said, I'm not going to be able to go through all of the different disease modifying therapies that are in active research, especially things that are early on. Uh, but these areas, I think, are ones where we may start to see um, a lot of progress in the near term. And also, I wanted to highlight some of these because some of these terms are probably things that you've heard about from colleagues, uh, family members, uh, read on the internet. And so I wanted to just maybe be able to provide a little bit more depth and understanding of each of these aspects. So we're gonna start from the beginning and kind of go through this list. What the majority of things that I'm gonna talk about uh, for the disease modifying therapy discussion is around uh, another term that I just want to clarify before we move on, which is cell protection. I have a cartoon here uh, that is uh, showing you, and you're going to see a couple of cartoons that I also want to orient you to. Um, this here is a brain cell, uh, and so we call it a neuron, uh, hence the term neurodegeneration. Uh, sometimes I'll call it a brain cell. But what happens in the context of uh, neurodegeneration, this is a healthy, normal brain cell. And what happens in the context of neurodegeneration is at the very extreme end, the brain cell dies and is dysfunctional. But it is a bit of a process. And along the way, uh, in the middle, there's probably some dysfunction to the cell that happens that may or may not be reversible. Uh, and that eventually leads to the loss of this cell. And so cell protection is an approach where we try and prevent this from happening. So a cell becomes more dysfunctional, we try and revive it. A cell is on its way to, to dying, we try and prevent that. And so for the most of what I'm gonna talk about next uh, in terms of disease modifying therapies, uh, except for the final topic at the end, are really ways where we're trying to protect cells. And the first I'm gonna talk about is exercise. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to talk about pharmacological therapies, which are drugs, but also some non-pharmacological therapies, so non-drug ways of, of hopefully protecting brain cells. And exercise, as I'm sure many of you are aware of and probably have conversations with your neurologist about, it can be an important feature um, for Parkinson's disease, uh, for people with Parkinson's disease, and for people without Parkinson's disease. And so when talking about exercise, I often like to start with just reminding us all, myself included, as well as others in the audience who don't have Parkinson's disease, that there are benefits to exercise that we all continually have to remember. So it's well known that exercise is good for our heart and our lungs. It gives us good cardiorespiratory fitness. It's good for our muscles and our bones. It's good for our cognition. And if I were giving a talk to an Alzheimer's group or a colleague of mine were giving a talk to an Alzheimer's group, exercise would probably be a part of that conversation as well, because it's good for thinking and memory. It's good for mood. Um, we know that it reduces risk of fractures and falls. Um, and then, you know, outside of the realm of Parkinson's disease, we know that exercise can reduce the risk of some very common conditions like hypertension and diabetes, as well as other conditions that can shorten our lifespan, such as heart disease and cancer. So already we have a number of reasons why we should all be exercising. Um, but what I wanna just touch on briefly, um, and one of the reasons why your Parkinson's disease neurologist uh, probably spends some time talking about exercise with you, is that there is some suggestion that exercise itself may provide some cell protection. Like I mentioned, we're just going to have a bit of a whirlwind tour, and I'm not going to be able to go into depth with all of the data and all of the details of, of the studies around each of the topics that I'm going to talk about. But I do want to just provide some high level kind of summaries of each of these areas. And so for exercise, I chose to show um, this uh, recently published kind of summarized slide of, I'd say, three of the um, larger and more convincing um, studies that uh, have suggested to us that exercise may have some potential for cell protection. And let me just explain to you what's being shown here. So the three different studies are one tested um, high intensity activity on a treadmill, one tested high intensity activity on a stationary bike, and one tested brisk walking together with a more complicated um, exercise program focused on balance, a little bit more multidisciplinary program. 
And in each of these studies, there was a group that um, didn't do the activity. So this group didn't do the, do the treadmill, whereas a group who did the exercise. So this group did do the treadmill. And um, what, the, what the bars here are showing you are changes in um, a, a score uh, of, of mobility. So a score that we use in clinical trials, but we also use it in the clinic. Some of you may be familiar when we get, uh, when you know neurologists get you to move your hands and tap your feet and walk down the hallway and maybe they pull you to see if you're on balance. Um, we give that a score, which gives us an indication of how affected people are from a motor point of view. And so a higher score means um, more motor abnormalities and a lower score means less motor abnormalities. So if you look here um, in this group that didn't do treadmill exercising, at the beginning of the study, they had a relatively, um, you know, this was the number that they started with. Um, but as time went on, uh, because Parkinson's disease progresses six months later, their numbers went up, which is typical for what happens in Parkinson's disease. Whereas in the group that exercised, it stayed level. Similar was found with a stationary bike. And even in this scenario here, People who did the exercise, whereas they started at this very relatively high number of their motor score, six months after they did exercise, they were actually able to reverse that and drop the degree of motor dysfunction. So this gives us some potential um, suggestion that um, exercise may be able to actually slow the progression of the disease, or in this scenario, actually improve the symptoms of Parkinson's disease over time. We still have a lot of work to understand why that may be the case, and we actually need more clinical trials to really um, hone down, look longer term, and understand what exercise uh, actually can do this. But at the level of the biology and how it is that exercise may be able to protect brain cells from not dying, one possibility that is suggested from laboratory studies is that exercise might, for one, reduce inflammation, which in general we know can be bad, especially in the brain. But importantly, it can also increase growth factors. And growth factors are naturally occurring um, factors that our brain makes that can actually support brain cells. And so one can imagine if you have an activity that can actually make the brain make more growth factor. And if growth factors support and help to prevent brain cells from dying, this can be a very viable and feasible way where, how exercise. But we obviously need more research to really understand if that is indeed the case, if that's indeed the case that happens in humans, and then really how can we, um, how can we, how can we make the most of that uh, in terms of maximizing out the growth factors that lead to all of the good things that happen in the brain, uh, such as protecting brain um, cells, um, uh, allowing in some cases for, for new brain cells to be made in certain parts of the brain and also to allow more blood uh, to flow to areas of the brain that need it. So this is a, an exciting area um, that does require more um, research, but definitely tells us that um, there is much to be gained uh, by exercise. Okay, I'm going to move on now to um, a, another, uh, 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 another topic on the list, which is alpha-synuclein. And this may be a topic that's familiar to many of you. This may be a topic that uh, you've heard very little about. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a 101 around alpha-synuclein. And first to say that it's a protein that uh, exists in our body, is very highly present in all of our brains and, um, and exists in, in all of our brains. It has a, it has a day job. Um, it probably helps brain cells to communicate with each other. But for reasons that aren't entirely clear, in Parkinson's disease, that protein uh, alpha synuclein can go a bit rogue. And what I'm showing here in this a cartoon, again, you can see this brain cell that I, you're going to see a lot of brain cells in, in this cartoon. But right here, this little cylinder represents normal alpha synuclein in all of our brains. Um, sometimes, um, and some research suggests that it can kind of form little um, structures together that also probably do something physiological, meaning it, it, it has a, a kind of normal function in the brain. But once it crosses this dotted line here, when alpha synuclein starts to actually stick, one alpha synuclein starts to stick to another alpha synuclein, starts to stick to another alpha synuclein, it forms what we call 
oligomers, protofibrils, or even fibrils. And the reason that they're called that is because they look like fibers. And when they actually then clump up even more, they form something that um, pathologists many years ago called Lewy bodies or Lewy neurites. And we think that this clumping up of alpha synuclein in some of these forms is detrimental to the brain cell. Um, it stops doing its day job, but it also probably starts to disrupt things in the cell. And I don't intend for you to read through all of this or even to understand all the science behind this. But what I want to highlight is that, again, I have a brain cell here. And within it is a variety of different things that are required for the brain cell to be healthy. So mitochondria make energy, this proteasomal system and the autophagy lysosomal system. They're important for getting rid of bad things in the cell because you need garbage disposal systems in the cell to get rid of the garbage. And what alpha synuclein does when it starts to aggregate in these and clump in these different types of forms is we think that it affects many of these systems so that the cell can no longer produce as much energy, it's no longer able to dispose of its garbage, and this is what leads to its demise. And as a consequence, um, the idea is that if we can actually target alpha synuclein, especially bad alpha synuclein, then we'd be able to actually protect the cell from dying. Again, another depiction of a brain cell, just to show you ways that are being explored as to how we could target alpha synuclein. So this is one brain cell here. This is another brain cell that lives next to it and communicates with it. And again, this is some basic biology that I'm not gonna go through in its entirety, but just to say that in a brain cell, to be able to make this protein alpha synuclein, there is a process that's involved. And uh, what I showed you in the previous cartoon is that alpha synuclein can exist by itself, but then when it starts to clump up, it starts to be problematic. And what you didn't see in the other cartoon, but I would just wanna point out here, is there is research to suggest that bad alpha synuclein in one brain cell may actually move to a neighboring brain cell and basically infect that brain cell with bad alpha synuclein. And so this cell that was initially affected by alpha synuclein and perhaps on its way to, to neurodegeneration has the capability of actually spreading alpha, bad alpha synuclein to its neighbor and then make this actual brain cell sick. So what researchers are doing are trying to approach this in a variety of different ways. Uh, one way is to potentially degrade bad alpha synuclein. Another way is to actually reduce its production in the cell. So instead of making kind of the, the normal amount of alpha synuclein, we try and make brain cells make less alpha synuclein. And if you have less alpha synuclein, then you're going to have less alpha synuclein that's going to aggregate and clump up. And then you're going to have less alpha synuclein that's going to infect a neighboring cell. There's also uh, strategies to try and actually just reduce these aggregates of alpha synuclein or prevent them from forming. And there's lastly uh, strategies to try and actually just prevent, so maybe this cell is affected by bad alpha synuclein, but if you can actually prevent alpha synuclein from moving from one cell to another, then you can actually potentially protect uh, the neighboring cells and prevent the spread of bad alpha synuclein from one to another. So these are a couple of different strategies and just what I've highlighted here, just so that you know, and some of them are very you know, um, uh, numeric names, but these are actually drugs that are being investigated in clinical trials. And this is not even an exhaustive list, but this is this are a couple of different drugs that are retested in clinical trials that are testing each of these approaches. And so um, I think we're going to, you know, the expectation is that we'll get results from some of these clinical trials in the next year or so. Um, and um, and depending on what that shows, it may progress on to the next phases of the clinical trial. But this is a very active area of investigation. And um, I hope that for those who haven't heard of alpha synuclein before, you now are familiar with it because I think we'll be hearing more and more about it uh, in the upcoming years. Next on the list um, is uh, are, are two other different proteins uh, called GBA or glucose reversidase and LERC2. And I mentioned these two because again this is an area that's being very actively investigated and GBA and LERC2 are interesting um, proteins and discoveries uh, in that we think that they're involved in Parkinson's disease. And, and why we came up with this idea is basically based on genetics. So this isn't a talk about genetics, and I'm sure um, some of you may have questions about genetics, but 
Again, I'll just give you a, a brief overview of what we know about genetics and Parkinson's disease. We know that approximately, again, this is just approximate, maybe one out of 10 people with Parkinson's disease has an abnormality in a gene that we can identify. And one of these genes uh, is called GBA1, makes the protein GBA1, and one is called LERC2. And with the discovery that abnormalities in these genes can cause Parkinson's disease, this allowed us to understand how these proteins actually may cause neurodegeneration. And as a result, um, have allowed us to start to try and find ways to affect these different proteins um, to, uh, to, to find benefit for cells. This is just a table of a couple of uh, genes that have been identified to be associated with Parkinson's disease. Like I said, only one in 10 people with Parkinson's disease may have an abnormality in their gene. Um, and the most common ones are GBA1 and LERC2. But let me just tell you a little bit about what we know about GBA and LERC2. Here's an even simpler diagram. This circle represents a brain cell. This circle within the brain cell re represents what we call a lysosome, which is one of the disposal systems um, of, of the cell. And um, you know, the lysosome disposes of a lot of things. One thing we think it gets rid of is actually alpha-synuclein. Interestingly, GBA or glucose rubricidase lives within the uh, lysosome. And in scenarios where people have a mutation in their uh, GBA gene, this enzyme, which breaks down things uh, uh, and actually disposes of things, is actually underactive. That's why I have the red arrow here. So understandably, if you could actually enhance its activity, um, activate it, one could potentially reverse its dysfunction and make it work again or work better. And so similar to the previous diagram I showed you, this, these are a couple of examples of uh, different drugs or strategies that are in clinical trial right now that are intended in Parkinson's disease and related diseases to actually enhance GBA function. And so these again are areas that are actively being investigated and um, we'll be excited to see what the results are. On the flip side, this other protein called LERC2 um, is, is an interesting protein that probably has a number of different functions, but it probably actually um, also works on the uh, pathway that includes the lysosome. So we call this the autophagy lysosomal pathway, which again is a disposal system of the cell. And what is known about LERC2 um, when it's mutated and it causes Parkinson's disease is that this protein actually, the mutation causes it to be overactive. So it does too much. And too much in this scenario is a bad thing. So it doesn't help the degradation, but it actually causes this to be a dysfunctional system. And so based on that, um, logically, if one could dampen down the activity of LERC2 and make it not so overactive, uh, one could presumably find a way to actually um, reduce its negative effects uh, on neurodegeneration. And again, shown here are two examples of, of, of drugs that are in clinical trial that are intended to do exactly that, that are trying to either reduce alpha-synuclein uh, activity by trying to actually reduce its amount or actually trying to make its um, activity decrease by, by using a chemical. And so similarly, uh, the, like I said, these are in clinical trial and we'll start to get answers as to whether or not this is a useful approach in Parkinson's disease. Okay, now we're gonna move on to um, a really big area of discussion, uh, but I wanna just to highlight maybe some of the most recent highlights, uh, uh, most recent discoveries. And I'm going to talk about um, this topic called repurposed drugs. Again, just to get us all on the same page, I'm going to just define for you what a repurposed drug is, or similarly, what the process of drug repurposing is. So drug repurposing, the intention is for us to actually, at the end of it, have a repurposed drug. And so what this approach is, is actually looking at drugs that are already approved for human use for treatment of other diseases. And see if we can actually find in the context of Parkinson's disease, 
see if there are drugs that are out there that we're using for other indications that actually may, unknown, unbeknownst to us, have actually some cell protection or disease modifying uh, capabilities in Parkinson's disease. I'm gonna talk about that in one moment, but just before that, just to kind of solidify um, this notion of drug repurposing, I'm gonna use this one example um, that may be uh, a drug that's familiar to many of you, which is amantadine. So amantadine in and of itself, it's not a disease modifying therapy for Parkinson's disease. Um, it's, 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 it's not something that is protective for cells, um, but it's a symptomatic therapy that is commonly used. And I think it's a nice example um, of how uh, drugs can be repurposed even within Parkinson's disease. So what many of you may or may not know is that amantadine itself, um, so currently the most common use that we have for amantadine in Parkinson's disease is actually to treat dyskinesia. So people who've developed uh, dyskinesia due to having Parkinson's disease and being on levodopa, in many scenarios, amantadine can reduce those dyskinesia. And that's the majority of the time when I'm prescribing amantadine, that's what it's for. But in fact, it was not developed for that at all. Uh, it was actually developed as a, as, a, as a treatment for flu. So for influenza back in the 1960s, it was used if people had an influenza infection or to actually prevent influenza infections. And it's a wonderful story of how important it is to listen to each other and to learn from each other that uh, back in the 1960s, a woman with Parkinson's disease who was on uh, amantadine um, due, to, due to the flu um, told her doctor, you know what, I think that um, my Parkinson's symptoms are better uh, since I've been on this medication, amantadine. And so that led, uh, the, her doctor listened, which was an important thing. Um, and that led to um, studies to say, what is that, I, is what this person actually observed, is that actually true? And studies actually showed that amantadine can be useful for Parkinson's disease symptoms. And in the 1970s, uh, you know, and, and before levodopa became uh, our most uh, potent and available medication, and even just before it became really took off in terms of being available for treatment of Parkinson's disease, if you were if you were diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, amantine probably would have been the medication you were started on to help your tremor and your stiffness and your slowness. And uh, eventually uh, we found other, you know, levodopa is a more effective medication and, and still some people will be started on amantadine for their Parkinson's disease symptoms. But in the same vein, what was also discovered was that um, people who were on amantadine when they had Parkinson's disease and levodopa started to be used more frequently, it became obvious that actually amantadine was helping dyskinesias. And so uh, this drug that was developed for influenza got repurposed as a Parkinson's disease drug for motor symptoms, and then eventually got repurposed as a medication to treat levodopa-induced dyskinesia. So I just like to use that example because it hits close to home and because it's an example of a really nice example of kind of double repurposing of a drug. But getting back to disease-modifying therapies, um, it's interesting, and I, I like to point this out, that if we go back to this um, figure of Kevin McFarthings that has all of the different disease-modifying therapies that are in clinical trial, uh, I did a count out of all of them of how many of these drugs uh, are, are already approved drugs for other indications. And, and over a third of them actually um, are, uh, that have, are being tested as potential disease-modifying therapy drugs and are in clinical trial are actually um, Purpose drugs. Oops. Not quite sure what happened there. Um, give me one moment. Okay. Um, are actually, so as I was saying, uh, over one third of drugs being tested as potential disease modifying therapies are actually repurposed uh, drugs. Um, and the advantage of repurposed drugs is that they've already been tested in humans. So these are not drugs that have only been tested in the laboratory and now we're moving them into safety studies within humans. We know that they are safe in humans because they've been used for other indications. And this allows for us to potentially get quicker results because we don't have to go through all the safety stages of testing drugs and many drugs will actually fail at the safety stages. So the expectation is that we may be um, able to get to success in terms of having a drug for treatment faster. 
One drug um, that you've already seen in the list that I've showed you that is actually a repurposed drug uh, comes off of this list of uh, medications that might activate a GBA. And so Ambroxol is being tested in clinical trial and in its earlier clinical trial uh, showed some promise. It's actually a, a cough suppressant. Um, uh, it needs to be used at higher doses in, in, in the potential for it to, to reduce disease, uh, to resu reduce disease progression. Uh, but it is a drug that um, uh, has already been used for a different indication, and this has allowed it actually to, to go quite quickly from a phase two and, and uh, onto a, a potential phase three trial. One that's um, been in the news just very recently, and I, I bring this up here because I could tell you even this past week, I've had uh, patients in my clinic asking about it, and I imagine maybe many of you have the same kinds of questions, is um, this drug category uh, of, uh, of medications called GLP-1 receptor activators. Um, and uh, you know, I use the trade name because you'll be most familiar with this, but the kind of um, most familiar drug in this category is Ozempic. Um, of course, Ozempic is not the only drug uh, that exists as this category, but this, these are drugs that were primarily developed for diabetes. Um, this here is just another cartoon um, that's complicated because uh, cell biology is complicated, but I just wanted to point out that what uh, GLP-1 receptor activators do is they bind to a receptor that sits on the outside of a cell and as a consequence of that, many things happen within the cell, which is just shown here in this, in this kind of uh, uh, rectangle. And all of these effects that happen in the cell, there's a lot of suggestion that they have a lot of positive outcomes. So they can improve memory, they can improve cell survival, um, they can improve the effects of the mitochondria, they can reduce inflammation, uh, they can reduce alpha-synuclein. So you can see there's a number of reasons why this class of drugs may be beneficial in Parkinson's disease. And understandably, this, uh, these drugs are being very actively investigated. So exenatide is uh, probably the first one to ever be tested. There's various versions of exenatide that have been in clinical trials or are in clinical trials. And then there are two related um, medications that uh, have been in clinical trials or are in clinical trials. With the last one, lixenatide, um, actually the results of the phase two trial just being published in the New England Journal of Medicine last week and causing uh, a lot of excitement uh, because this trial showed that in Parkinson's disease, um, I told you at the beginning in exercise, uh, in those graphs that I showed you around exercise, how we uh, score um, abnormalities in motor function that uh, it was shown that uh, treatment with lixxenatide can actually, again, stabilize the change in those numbers um, over the course of approximately one year. And so more work definitely has to be done here, and this is a phase two trial. And so uh, the question becomes, and, and the hope is that we're gonna move on to a phase three trial, but it's the beginnings, I think, of a bit of a signal um, that this class of drug um, may be beneficial in Parkinson's disease. We talked about cell protection. For the last minute or so in this in the realm, I wanna talk about um, a topic that many people often ask about, which is cell replacement. So we talked about cell protection, trying to prevent these cells from degenerating. Um, the alternative in terms of uh, trying to have an effect on the neurodegenerative process is actually to replace the cells. So forget about the sick and dying cells, um, why not bring in brand new spanking cells um, to try and replace the ones that are, um, are, are dying? And so this approach is cell replacement or cell transplant. And one of the um, areas that is really active for this is in stem cell uh, replacement. I'm not gonna go again through the long history, uh, but for many, many uh, years, um, there have been studies to investigate whether or not we could actually replace cells in the Parkinson's disease brain. And very early studies um, used tissue from human fetal tissue um, to actually dissect out cells that made dopamine and do a surgery to put them, uh, you know, prepare the cells and do a surgery to actually put them into the brain of people with Parkinson's. And it was shown that they, I mean, there's a lot of nuance to this and a lot of complications, but there were long lasting clinical benefits. 
Um, however, the the real feasibility of it was limited because um, uh, it was it was too hard to actually have enough tissue to study uh, and to in the long term really to provide. But within the past decade or so, technology around stem cells uh, has really blossomed um, and uh, the technological advances have been remarkable. So one can actually take blood cells or skin cells from somebody uh, or embryonic stem cells and actually make them into dopamine cells. And so now this has really invigorated the field to use this new, new, um, new formulation and kind of new generation of stem cells uh, in stem cell transplants. And this is again just a bird's eye view um, how of of how enthusiastic people are around it. That what's shown here in blue are countries around the world where there are clinical trials uh, that are investigating different type of stem cells in Parkinson's disease, uh, all being delivered into the brain. So for the last minute or so, uh, I do want to touch on, you know, we just had a whirlwind tour through the advances. Um, I'm excited about the advances that are being made. I'm hoping that you're finding some of excitement in this as well. But I also just want to temper things a little bit by talking about some of the challenges, some of the things that, um, you know, we don't have answers to, um, some of the things that we're really going to have to need to focus on uh, over the upcoming um, years to decades. And again, this is not uh, a comprehensive. Uh, these are a couple of things for us to keep in mind. Um, the four different things that I'll just touch on are questions. So do we have the right dose? Are we targeting the right targets? Are we treating at the right time? And most importantly, are we treating the right people? So from the right dose point of view, I just use the example, this really, I mean, with drugs, we can test a whole bunch of different drug doses. And there's always the question of whether or not we have the right dose. But I think especially in the exercise realm, what is the right dose is really an area of active investigation. And I think we're going to start seeing many, many studies to try and get this right. Um, this I've taken actually from the Parkinson's Foundation, a wonderful sheet uh, to give you uh, an outline as to what kind of exercise you should be doing. And there are some doses listed here, um, but we don't know what the best dose is. This is, you know, this is this is the best that we could guess. Um, and so I think that there's going to be studies to be able to really hone in on what kind of amount of exercise should we be doing? How frequently should it be to really glean all the benefits, the, mo the most benefit that we could from exercise? So I think that's one area um, that there's still some challenges in. And there become challenges in being able to how to study this in a clinical trial, um, because exercise in a clinical trial is actually a more challenging uh, type of intervention to study than, than you know, giving a drug. And so um, this is one thing that we have to keep in mind in terms of a challenge. The other challenge is I showed you lots and lots of different cell biology today, and it's backed by a huge amount of laboratory research, um, but we still need to learn more. We think we have things right in terms of what we want our drugs to target. So I told you about alpha-synuclein, about the underactivity of GBA, the overactivity of LERC2, about this GLP-1 receptor that seems to have great effects if it can get activated. Um, so we think we have the right targets, but, um, but, but we may not. Um, we may be missing targets. Um, what all the evidence that we have from the laboratory, uh, we may be missing things there. And so I think we have to keep an open mind that we go with the best evidence that we have and the best knowledge that we have today. But we also have to keep an open mind that we're not always right. Uh, and that if the evidence starts pointing us into a different direction, that we need to explore that. And that's where we need more research. The other important challenge is really the right time. I show this graph again that I uh, showed at the very beginning and over the, you know, from left to right here is the time of disease. Right here is where you'd be diagnosed with, a, with, with Parkinson's disease, but we, we think that the disease process happens earlier. And so the question becomes, when we have that great drug that's gonna slow the progression of the disease, when is gonna be the best time to give it? Do we need to give it super early before the before the you know before the disease even really takes hold and we can actually see the symptoms? Is it okay if we just start the treatment as soon as somebody gets diagnosed with Parkinson's disease? Will there be benefit for people who are many, many years into their Parkinson's disease with these treatments? Again, this is unanswered questions and these are going to be challenges. In our clinical trials, we tend to just study people who are kind of right here 
um, uh, at uh, the very beginning of their disease. And so it's going to have to, we're going to have to understand if that's uh, going to be applicable to people at other stages of the disease. And then I think lastly, and most importantly, we have to know if all of these treatments that we're developing, who's the right person for them. This is a wonderful diagram um, by colleagues, Melissa Armstrong and Michael Oaken, that were put uh, just to remind us that Parkinson's disease looks different. People, not everyone with Parkinson's disease looks like the old fashioned diagram that we often see from the 1800s, but people can look different. It's a global disease. It affects a range of ages, um, different genders. And as I'm sure many in the audience know, uh, medication regimens that you're on now are probably different than uh, the person who you, who you you meet at your support group or the other person you know, your neighbor who has Parkinson's disease. And I think the expectation is gonna be the same with disease modifying therapies that not everybody is going to be um, a person who's going to need an, a medication to reduce alpha nuclei. Not everybody's gonna be a person who needs a medication to reduce uh, LERC2 activity. And we're gonna have to really understand who the right person is to get the right treatments. And in some cases, probably a number of these different treatments. So with that, I just wanna close out just to remind you um, and hope that um, we've had uh, a useful discussion around advancements in disease modifying approaches for Parkinson's disease. We talked about uh, non-pharmacologic measures such as exercise, as well as surgical measures such as uh, stem cell replacement, which is taking stem cells and, and surgically putting them into the brain. And then we talked about a lot of different pharmacological approaches. I showed you some of the drugs that are in clinical trial that are targeting alpha-synuclein, GBA1, LERC2, um, and then the repurposing drug approach. And then I just want to lastly just to remind everyone that um, this is, um, you know, not a linear road, uh, that uh, research is necessary. It's not always, uh, we sometimes um, hit roadblocks. Uh, we sometimes go down paths that are not fruitful. Uh, but I think the importance is that uh, we're all in it together and we're here to really try and make a difference. Um, and, and I, like I said at the beginning, I'm optimistic that um, we're going to see more and more progress over the upcoming years. And so with that, um, I just wanna thank you so much for your attention. I again, wanna thank the Parkinson's Foundation for giving me the opportunity to talk during uh, Parkinson's Awareness Month. Please teach others about Parkinson's disease. Um, you know, the people who, who, who've not been touched by the disease, make sure they understand what it is and, and we continue our job of teaching each other. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Kali. I really appreciate your knowledge and time today. And I'd like to introduce the Foundation's Senior Director of Research, Svetlana Svage, who will be moderating our question and answer session. Thank you, Dr. Kalia, for an excellent and incredibly organized and uh, detailed presentation. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that many of the questions that uh, we received, uh, you already answered through your uh, presentation. Uh, before we go with additional you know, questions from our listeners, um, I was wondering, uh, one thing that struck me the most is that uh, the so wide range of research that is being done in so many different areas. And I know that in 2023, over 1,800 publications have been published uh, on PD. Uh, why? Uh, so wide range of research is necessary. I really want, if you can please emphasize that. Yeah, for sure. Um, Parkinson's disease is complicated. Uh, it is a really complex condition. Uh, you know, I started at the beginning about how brain diseases are complicated and maybe it's my own bias, but I think Parkinson's disease is one of the most complicated uh, neurological diseases. Early in the, you know, early in this, the discovery of the disease, it was thought that it was uh, a movement disorder, a simple movement disorder. And so if we could, you know, improve mobility and tremor, it would be done. Uh, but we know that it's a multifaceted disease. Um, it has more than just mo movement abnormalities. It has all of the other non-motor aspects. And I think what I was also trying to touch on at the end, which tells us about the complexity of diseases, each person is so very different. And so 
if we were looking at just a homogeneous, just one single very simple disease, I think uh, we wouldn't need as many different avenues of investigation. But because there are so many facets to it, um, that's one reason why there's a lot of uh, a lot of research. And then today, I just really highlighted um, the approach towards trying to understand disease modification that really needs to be coupled with biomarker research, which is a whole nother area of investigation. And that's partly also, I think where we're seeing a huge amount of research and, and a huge contributor to probably those number of publications you saw. And then I think we really also have to understand that these are our advances that we're hoping are gonna happen, but they're probably not gonna happen tomorrow. They're gonna be years away. And so there's a ton of research for us to really you know, make Parkinson's disease the best that it can be today. And so a good amount of research is also trying to just find ways to live well in things that we could do today and now as we wait and continue to work towards those uh, better treatments. And with all the complexity that uh, you just described and, and um, individual differences, do you think it will eventually be only a single treatment and or a single cure? Or should we expect that uh, we will have to have a combination of different things? Yeah, I definitely think it's not going to be a single treatment. Um, and I think as many people with Parkinson's know right now, even our symptomatic therapies, right? The, nobody's on this one single, well, I mean, not everybody's on one single drug at one dose. And so uh, I, I, one can uh, see that the disease modifying therapies are going to also be the same. I think probably the initial therapies that we find aren't gonna be applicable to everybody. Um, and I think that makes sense when you have a disease that has different aspects. Um, and, and, and one wonders if there's going to be treatments that we might wanna give just early in the disease. Um, and maybe as the disease changes, stop those ones. And maybe there's gonna be other ones that we're gonna to wanna to give at a different uh, stage of the disease. So I do think, you know, we always talk about a silver bullet, I, and I think that it's fair to say that we're not going to have one silver bullet, that it's going to be um, a number of different therapies, which is why I think it's important that we have our eggs in multiple baskets. I think that if we had our eggs in only a single basket, I think we're going to miss out on probably being able to have therapies for a, a different people. And so that's, I think, another reason why there's so much a need for so much research is we want to be able to kind of spread things out to really maximize our uh, potential for um, finding therapies for everyone. So our viewer Kevin is asking for further clarification on disease modifying therapies, and he's wondering why are we finding that they are working to help multiple sclerosis and not Parkinson's? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and I can tell you that um, I think it's such a great question that uh, I worked with a colleague to bring together Parkinson's disease specialists and, and multiple sclerosis specialists uh, in Toronto a, a year ago for us to just really learn from them. Um, and I, I think there's a variety of different things um, that uh, came out of that discussion. Uh, one, uh, and again, my talk wasn't about biomarkers, and I'm sure that you guys are going to have talks or have already had talks about biomarkers. But one is that multiple sclerosis has the advantage of being able to do a brain scan and say, yeah, this, it really looks like this person has multiple sclerosis. We're only at the, you know, just the beginnings of maybe having uh, what we call a biomarker to be able to identify people with Parkinson's disease. So, so that's been an important thing. Um, some, some of my colleagues will argue that multiple sclerosis being an inflammatory or an immune disease is an easier disease to treat. It's not as complicated as the neurodegenerative disease, but, um, but I think in, in multiple sclerosis, uh, there is also neurodegeneration and, and, and the multiple sclerosis colleagues will argue that the neurodegenerative piece is actually a challenge for them to treat as well. So, um, they are different diseases, uh, and, um, and, uh, but I think there's things to learn, uh, from the multiple sclerosis field that, that can help us in Parkinson's disease. Well, I think we are running, uh, out of time. Uh, so we definitely have not been able to answer all of the questions, uh, our viewers had, but, uh, our helpline will, uh, and the resources on our website will certainly address that. But I want to thank you, Dr. Kalia. It was a pleasure having you and uh, learning from you uh, about the latest uh, research updates and how scientists are working to find the new ways to slow down and hopefully end Parkinson's disease. And I will turn it to my colleague, Krista.
Thank you, Svetlana. Dr. Kalia, before we close, are there any final remarks that you would like to make before we do our outro remarks and thanking our community for being here today? I just want to say thank you to all of you. Thanks for coming out today. And uh, and uh, um, the whole Parkinson's community is my inspiration. So thank you. And thank you to everyone for joining us in this time to gay today through Zoom land. We did have a significant response during our Q&A session and unfortunately we weren't able to get to them all. So please, if your question was not answered, call our helpline at 1-800-4PD-INFO. You can learn more about Parkinson's and research and how you can get involved at parkinson.org slash research. This concludes today's expert briefings. Next month, our expert briefing series will dive into the sleep challenges of Parkinson's. You can learn more about our future topics and register at the webpage listed here on the screen. And again, thanking our webinar sponsors, UCB and Novartis for supporting the mission of the Parkinson's Foundation. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We have a comprehensive website and many more resources that address everything related to PD at parkinson.org. And you can call our helpline. That number again is 1-800-4PD-INFO or email us at helpline at parkinson.org. But before you go, please know that our programming is fueled by your input and your feedback. As we close the Zoom screen today's webinar, a survey will prompt up so please, we appreciate if you take the time to let us know what you hope to learn in future sessions. Take care, and we'll see you soon on the next expert briefing.